Street uh, is a vacant lot in the Lachlan Springs East End Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. And this is a proposal to construct a new house on the vacant lot. Um, there's a front elevation. At 48 feet tall and 52 feet wide, this infill would likely be one of the larger infill projects we've seen in, in a long time. However, uh, it is on a block or in a block of the East End neighborhood that has very large houses. Um, the proportions of the new building will be compatible with those of the adjacent building to the right at 120 South 12th Street, uh, which is the left image there. It's known as the Ambrose House. And uh, also with 116 South 12th Street, which is the image, the house to the right and the image to the right. Uh, I took that picture from, is that Holly Street, just because the the trees, that's that's actually the side elevation, but uh, still get, get the idea. Uh, so the new house will be brick. So yeah, it'll be brick with a stone foundation and stone trim. Uh, it'll have an asphalt shingle roof. Staff requests that the applicant seek administrative approval of brick sample, stone sample, and roof color. Uh, go around the side elevations. This is the left side that faces Russell Street. Um, primarily a hipped roof with some gable projections, a uh, consistent pattern of windows, uh, some arched window openings, elliptical arches uh, there on the side. Um, oops, sorry. There's, uh, it has a, an attached garage on the right side. Uh, staff finds that to be appropriate in this location because it is um, somewhat of a truncated lot and it doesn't have alley access. Uh, so in order to have any uh, off-street parking and attached garage uh, seemed appropriate and necessary. Uh, the garage, the plane, the wall that the garage is in is actually inset a few feet uh, from the outermost primary side facade, uh, side of that facade and behind a small side porch. So it, it helps to obscure uh, visibility of the garage. And there's the rear of the building. Um, there's a, a massing study provided by the architect. Uh, a few more images. These, I'll just flip through these because they're all in your presentation. But um, they look, they were, you know, they included them, and they seemed it would be, seemed a shame not to to share them with everybody. Uh, staff recommends approval of the proposed two-story infill at 124 South 12th Street, with conditions that the finished floor height is consistent with the finished floor height of the adjacent historic house, which staff would verify in the field that the front setback is consistent with the setback of adjacent houses. Again, to be verified, that brick and stone colors and textures are approved by staff, that window and door selections are approved by staff, roof color approved by staff, and that utility and HVAC connections are located behind the midpoint of the building on a non-street facing facade. And meeting those conditions, staff finds that this project will meet the guidelines for new construction in the Lachlan Springs East End Conservation Zoning Overlay. Thank you, Sean. Is the applicant here? Okay. You have no comment? Are, are you in agreement with, you are in agreement with everything? Very well, we will put that in record. Thank you so much. Um, we still open for public hearing. Anyone would like to speak on this project? If not, we will close public. Oh, yes, council member, I apologize for that. Good afternoon, uh, commissioners. I don't get here very often, so it's great to see you. And we've had some turnover on the board since the last time I was here. So for members I haven't seen before, thank you for your service. Um, uh, just wanted to speak in favor of this application. Um, this particular context in East End, um, you know, usually in Lachlan Springs in particular, we're looking at bungalows and things like that. But this context on this particular block of this particular street, um, you know, a bungalow form would be inappropriate. 
it um, because it does feature grand homes on very, very large lots. Um, the property next door had been um, at one time the Ambrose House Historic Home Event Venue um, that was actually converted back into a residence not too long ago. It's a, a substantial uh, brick structure, multi-story. Um, and so I believe that when the property that property, this was originally part of that property. This was a side yard and it was sold. I don't know all the details, but it does sit on a double lot. Um, it's not often that we, um, usually we're seeing, you know, duplex forms that are, you know, twin twin porch duplexes and things like that on, uh, even on single lots. So to have um, to have a single family home on a double lot in that area is, is quite something. And um, again, this, um, this context is really calls for a grand structure. Uh, and I think the uh, applicant and the architect have done a really, really good job. A lot of times with staff, I'm, uh, I scrutinize attached garages closely, um, but again, in this truly unique context, I think I find it's appropriate and that it has been well um, concealed uh, from the street. So just wanted to speak in favor of that and thank the applicant and the architect for their efforts on this. Thank you, Council Member Britt Withers. I don't know if you had said your name. Everybody knows you, but we just want to make sure <laughs> that we had that on record as well. Okay, close public hearing. Um, commissioners, is there a motion or discussion? Yeah, I think it's grand to see a, a project of this scale that's appropriate to the surroundings. And, <laughs> and uh, so I, I move for approval with the staff conditions. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposition. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. 12, 12.39, is that correct? 6th Avenue North. And we're almost there, Edge Hill Group. We're almost there. Thank you for waiting for yes. the neighborhoods. 1239 6th Avenue North is a circa 1890s brick commercial structure that contributes to the historic character of the Germantown historic preservation overlay. Uh, it's located at the corner of 6th Avenue North and Madison, oh, I'm sorry, Monroe Street, and I think most people know it as the former Mad Platter restaurant. In May 2017, MHCC approved the demolition of the rear addition that's existing and the construction of a new rear addition. Um, since that time, the commission has adopted revised design guidelines for Germantown. Um, but this application is a new design by a new applicant. Um, the applicant is not proposing any major alterations to the existing historic structure. Um, the brick will remain unpainted and they'll do some um, painting to the trim and some repairs as needed. Um, but other than that, the existing structure should remain as is. Here's the existing rear addition that is proposed to be demolished. The date of construction of the rear addition is not exactly known, but um, the 1914 and 1954 Sanborn maps show rear additions in this location, but show them with a different footprint. Um, staff finds the rear extensions, materials, form, roof slope, fenestration pattern, and date of construction do not contribute to the historic character of the historic commercial structure. Therefore, we find that its removal meets section 7B2 of the design guidelines. Here is a site plan um, showing the existing structure, the addition to be removed, and the new addition. Staff finds that location at the rear, the width, the depth, um, and all of that meet the design guidelines. Before I show the elevation drawings, I wanted to highlight the design guidelines regarding materials in Germantown. The design guidelines state that all facades should be at least 80% brick. Um, fiber cement panels are appro approvable as an accent material. Um, the guidelines further state that a greater percentage of accent materials may be used on facades that are not visible from a public right-of-way. Um, the design guidelines also state that um, the guidelines only appear, uh, apply to the exterior of new construction. Um, public facades should be more carefully reviewed than non-public facades. And in Germantown, public facades include those visible from the public right-of-way as well as those from an alley or a greenway. So here is the um, Monroe Street uh, elevation drawing. Uh, staff finds that the addition's height, which is lower than that of the historic building, is appropriate. This facade is 80% brick um, and therefore does meet the design guidelines for materials. Um, the applicant is proposing on the ground floor that there be recessed areas that kind of mimic an, um, a window trimmed down as a window, but be 
instead of having glazing them, would have a fiber cement panel. Um, staff finds that this faux window opening treatment does not meet the design guidelines, which states that, quote, on corner commercial buildings, glazing shall just address both streets. These openings are not glazed, creating a long wall without any glazing. Staff recommends windows that are frosted or painted black on the interior, which will allow the applicant um, to wall over the windows on the interior. This is necessary because you can see on the floor plan that the um, location along Monroe Street is location of the kitchen and the freezer. Here is the rear facade. This facade is only 40% brick and will be visible from Monroe Street. The rear facade is approximately 46% brick, um, sorry, uh, uh, even though it's less than 80% brick. Staff finds that the amount of brick on the rear facade to be appropriate as part of the facade is neither brick nor fiber cement board panels, but is glazing. On this facade, the panels really, staff finds that they are accent materials. They're just covering the stairway, um, the stair tower, and staff finds that to be appropriate. In addition, historically, rear facades of commercial buildings like this one were more utilitarian in nature, even on a corner lot. The original rear addition to this building was not brick but wood, according to a 1908 map. So um, for these old maps that are color, you, the brick um, is indicated with pink coloring and the um, yellow is means wood or framing of sorts. Um, because of the, uh, you know, staff again finds that the less than 80% brick is okay on this rear facade for those reasons. Here's the left facade, which is the interior lot facade. This facade is 46% brick, which staff finds to be appropriate since the facade is not highly visible from a public right of way. While this facade may be seen from the alley, it will not be highly visible from either 6th Avenue North or Monroe Street. Uh, and the design guidelines state that a greater percentage of accent materials may be used on facades that are not visible from a public right of way. So um, again, therefore, staff finds that the 64% brick on this facade is appropriate. So in conclusion, staff is recommending approval with um, the following conditions. The window openings on the Monroe Street elevation have glazing in them, even if they are obscured on the interior. Um, that staff approve a brick sample on all windows and doors. Um, the texture and color of the membrane roof, uh, the canopy material, um, and the location of the HVAC units on all the other utility in all the other utilities. Uh, with these conditions, staff finds the proposed demolition in addition meet sections 3E five and seven of the design guidelines. Happy to answer any questions and the architect for the project is here as well. Melissa, I do have a question. Sure. On the um, pictures, I guess, what page is that? 23, um, where the original brick is on that part, is that gonna remain or is that gonna be taken down in new brick? That's that addition in the back? Oh, can you, um, um, I'm, not, I'm not exactly sure where you. Yeah, um, can you, one more back. This one? Um, the picture? Yeah, the picture. Okay. There, there, there we go, that part. Oh, the part of the facade that's currently brick? Yes. Um, then my assumption is that, the architect can clarify, but I'm 95% I'm sure that it's gonna be demolished, that the entire thing's gonna be taken down okay. and, and reconstructed. They're actually doing like kind of an alcove there. Um, and again, the architect could probably speak to this more, but I think a lot of the rear brick wall is existing um, and they're retaining it. And we're okay with them taking down a historical brick? I don't know if that brick is historic. I We're mean, if you sure. look at the, um, I mean, this is a 1908 map, so it's hard to know, um, but it's, in 1908, that was that was not brick there. That was a, um, a wood, maybe a porch, because it seems to be dotted addition at the back. Mm, okay. But, okay. Uh, I think you. the architect can answer the question, but I think that the brick wall is still existing behind it and they're retaining it. So let me go back to the picture. Um, so kind of where the end of the, you know, what we think is the original building ends, I think that the brick wall is, is still there. So like, so that, that brick section I don't think is original to the building. That's not. So the one story, yeah. According to the map. Yeah, okay, yeah. Yeah. thank you. Melissa, one question, and really it's, I think it's related to interpretation of the guidelines. Sure. Um, in other jurisdictions, you're sort of like, this percentage must be that and this percentage must be the other. Do we require 20% glass or is there any glazing percentage? No, in the other districts, we don't really have percentages um, in this way. Um, so we typically, in, in most of the other districts, we talk about the spacing of wall space that there, every eight to 15 feet, there should be a window opening. Um, I'm, I'm curious just how it's counted because a lot of, you know, if, if you have a facade that's 20% glass, that's the whole facade. And right. the other 80 has to be brick 
is that how this calculation is done? Or if you ask them to add another window, suddenly it's not 80% sure. correct. Sure. Yeah. I'll tell you the way I calculated this when I came up with these numbers was um, basically I took, you know, use the existing, uh, the existing um, historic building and didn't really take glazing into consideration for, for that, just kind of did the rectangular box, did the rectangular box for the brick on the ground floor of the addition and then rectangular box for the um, glass and panel. That's the way I calculated it. Gotcha. This, because the design guidelines are fairly new, we haven't really developed a way to calculate the 80% brick yet. So. I would encourage some clarity there yeah. in the future. I'm not, not necessarily on this one, but I, I, I think <laughs> I'm putting myself in an applicant's position that could be a point of wh how, where you start from calculating is, is, is always, uh, mm -hmm. how you measure is always a thing, I think, when it comes to guidelines. Thanks. Okay. Is the applicant here? Hello, I'm Leslie Beeman. Um, I'm recovering from a cold, so if I, and I'm the annoying guy in the back that's been coughing all night, I'm, I apologize. <laughs> Uh, my personal address is uh, 206 Corey Drive in Franklin, uh, but I work for Manuel Zeitlin Architect and I'm representing uh, an, a group who's excited to revitalize this iconic building, um, hopefully turn it back into a new successful and a fun restaurant to be at. Uh, the addition uh, is mainly services uh, that help bring the old building, the historic building up to code. Um, it's kitchens, bathrooms, lifts, mechanical spaces and a small dining room on the on the second floor uh, primarily it's it's uh, it, the the idea is to try to leave the historic building alone save it preserve it and then put all our services in the back uh, so there's not a whole lot of room for windows on the ground floor um, the uh, the windows that the, the sort of recesses that you see that mimic windows in the back um, are up against the cooler and freezer. Um, I, I think there's technical problems with putting glass in the in that facade. Um, you basically create little solar ovens. Um, the materials in, in behind the glass tend to de deteriorate rapidly. Um, there's always a danger that humidity is going to get in there and it's going to fog up. And you don't have a way to get in there and clean it um, and, and maintain it, uh, particularly with a walk-in cooler behind it. Um, so I'm happy to look at other options for um, treating those recesses. Um, I, I would request that be, we be relieved of uh, having to do the glass. Other than that, we're, we're happy with all of uh, the staff recommendations. Um, and. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be available. Thank you. Thank you. Open public hearing. <laughs> Sonia Link, 13086 Avenue North. I'm a member of the uh, Germantown Historic Board and the Development Committee, and we have some concerns about the amount of cement panel that's on the rear and left facade of the building. As Melissa indicated, the new guidelines do indicate that 80% of facade should be brick and that the cement panels uh, can be used as accent material. And one of the reasons when we revised the guidelines to put 80% brick is because we had so much new construction being built with the cement panels, which is really not appropriate for the neighborhood. So we wanted to drastically reduce that, but we didn't want to really limit all the developers to uh, use no cement panels. So that's why we said it would be okay for accent material. As Melissa also indicated that the guidelines clarify that the um, public facades are facades that are visible from the public right of way, the street, the alley, and the greenway. Uh, the rear of the building will be very visible. Uh, as noted, this is a corner lot, uh, but what should also be noted that uh, across from the alley is a vacant lot that's used by the church as a parking lot. So it's highly visible from Monroe. And the uh, left side of the building will be visible from the alley. 
Therefore, uh, we request that uh, the um, guidelines be more closely adhered to and require a higher percentage of brick and possibility is, you know, replacing some of the cement panels with more brick. Uh, one of the concerns also is because this is only like the third project that's come before the commission using the new guidelines, and we want to make sure that we don't set any precedent for future projects allowing a great percentage of the cement panels. So... I think that's it. I think that's all. You know, other than that, we're fairly happy with the new addition. We're just uh, concerned about the cement panels because we're wanting to reduce that material to be used in new construction and additions in the neighborhood. Thank you, Ms. Link. Anyone else? Okay. We are closing public hearing. Discussion, commissioners. Should we check with the applicant to see if they wanted to rebut? We shall. <laughs> Will the applicant want to? We're happy with the uh, uh, staff guidelines and request that we follow those. Okay, thank you. Um, since they didn't hear you on record, the applicant <laughs> is. Yes, well, um, we're happy with the staff guidelines uh, regarding the uh, exterior building materials and we'll request that we uh, follow those. And also you'll work with them on the application for glazing? That's what he's requesting. Is that, oh, that you, okay, gotcha. And All right. A, yeah, that's a different question. All right. Yes. Now close public hearing. So just a quick question, I guess, for Melissa. Is talking about the the two or the one note you brought up from the guidelines was the, uh, you know, more care for the public right of way, you know, and then, um, yeah, the facades. It, and then the applicant said, I couldn't see in any of the photos and I, I, I can't remember. Is that, an, is that an alley next door a, or on the other side? In the staff report, there is the um, metro map and the aerial view. Um, there is an alley that kind of that goes behind, um, that runs behind, you know, off of, you get, you access it from Monroe Street. Oh, yeah, so there it is. Thank you. It's at, it's at the back. And then the lot behind it is vacant. May I interject one, one thing? Yes. Um, the the the, uh, the lot behind the building is intended to be a, a garden for the restaurant's use. Um, it has m some very mature maple trees and crepe myrtles, and we're going to revitalize that area as well um, with new fencing and new uh, new paving patterns that, that we'll work through with staff uh, as that develops. But uh, the garden is intended to be an amenity. Um, to the restaurant and not just a vacant lot. Okay, thank you. And then regarding that side with the cement board, I mean, that's, it looks like from the front, the photo I'm looking at, I mean, you know, that there's a, that's not an app, not that side, the other side. Um, that's a home next door, and then, but I mean, there's a tree, so it seems like that rear part of the building isn't s visible from the street that much. Is no, that I don't the reasoning think you took for the the allowance of the yeah, the, that side facade won't be visible. I mean, it might be minimally visible from Sixth Avenue North, and maybe minimally visible from Monroe Street, but it won't be. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't say it'd be highly visible. And Caitlin, it's not visible. It's not really visible because you've got that residential and there's lots of greeneries that's there too. Uh, I'm not saying it's, you yeah. know, I'm not saying we're going to approve that, but I'm just saying it's not visible uh, as public right of way. Uh, 
you know, I think the staff has done a good job at interpreting the guidelines. It does say 80% brick, and then it goes on to say in those areas where it's not as visible, the accent materials can be greater. So I think uh, having the brick wrap around the corner on the back from where it is visible from the street, uh, I think uh, addresses that. And so I'm comfortable with that. And then I feel the same way, Commissioner Stewart. And then for the, in the back as well to cover that stairwell, um, you know, I, I, you know, with the brick in the back, I think I think it looks um, nice. And then on the other facade, um, just because it's in the rear, not visible from one of the public right of ways, um, I have no problem with that either. So. Unless someone else wants to jump in, moving on to the applicant's question for the glazing. You know, I've never, we've never come across something that is a like a faux, faux window. You know, it's an opening but not a window or a, to be visible. So I don't know. I, I guess I'd like to see what you all think about it. Um, you know, is it if we just if they have glazing and then. Just frost it and put something right in front of the window. Is that really still a window? You know, I mean, it's still going to be pitch black. So, uh, you know, so I'd kind of like to hear your thoughts on it, um, since we've never come across it. You know, it, it's a standard practice in architecture to use a span spandrel panel uh, that is manufactured to be an exterior wall material that has glass on the outside. So I think that that's a, an appropriate response here. And on Monroe, I mean, there, you shouldn't have equipment and everything out on Monroe that would be a problem with that, so. Yes, uh, I've got a sort of deep dive on, on that. Sure. I agree, with spandrel glass is certainly in, in a storefront situation it is appropriate. In this case, and on this building being historic, the addition, of course, not, not historic, would, um, I d I'm not aware of spandrel being readily available on your standard casement type window. Um, it looks like the upper floors are probably going to be some bit of storefront, but I just want, if we're, if we're, Requesting to have the owner, I don't want to request something that they, you know, that then puts them in violation of, of what the staff would, would approve on a ground floor window. Does that make sense? Um, I mean, it does. I mean, we can always, if it's something isn't possible, we can always work with them on another material, bring it back. But um, I guess we'll defer to your expertise. I, I do want to ask a question related to the guidelines and materials. Um, this is, is this new construction or is it an addition? It is both. <laughs> so um, the design guidelines state that all additions should follow the design guidelines for new construction. Okay. And that's typical for most of our districts where the additions contains things that pertinent to additions, but a lot of the material information is actually covered under new construction. I, um, I don't disagree with your analysis on this particular project, but um, I'm a little, I, there's some concern in, in the way that the guideline for materials is written. Um, and by that, I mean, it says item bullet point one under F says all facades shall be at least 80% brick. Um, and I get back to my point before is, how are we measuring that? Because if we're encouraging glass and, and suddenly we're, that's that's just seems like an opportunity that maybe not on this project or the three that have been approved before it, but that, that seems like an area that we might get into a whole lot of discussion. And certainly those who wrote the guidelines might have one expectation and our interpretation of that might might in fact be another. So I think certainly for applicants, knowing going in on the front end, it would be helpful to clarify how that's going to work. Again, admitted that these are these are new and we're, we're doing the best we can. I have a question about brick color on the new addition. Um, I see in the guidelines it, it uh, suggests traditional colors ranging from red, orange to dark red. Obviously, we already have two brick colors on the historic building. What what is the staff approach going to be on approving a third brick color? The brick is actually the same color. What's the difference is, is the pointing is done differently. So when you're looking even at pictures, um, 
The, the, it's actually kind of it's kind of an illusion because it's okay. the mortar is they repointed the bottom but not the up floor I guess maybe they didn't want to pay for scaffolding, um, so <laughs> that, uh, it, that it was just poorly repointed. Yeah, well, poorly, yeah. So, um, um, so we would um, I think we'd probably want something to fairly closely match. I don't know if we would want an exact match, but we would be willing to work with the architect on either. So. Um, it's shown as a brown or tan color, but it, it won't be that, or, or will it? I'm not sure. We would have okay. to take a look at it. Um, Fred's on in our office is kind of our brick okay. person, and we usually defer to him in terms of looking at bricks. So, um, so you're saying that's just representation? I haven't had discussions with the architect about brick color yet. Just the general, we would want to recommend. We would want to review. Right. I mean, it. I guess because. Well said that since the plans look like they're light brown that we assume it's going to be this brown color. I think that's, you know, but that's that we shouldn't assume that. I, I wouldn't assume that just because, I mean, a lot of times, I mean, it could just be the coloring and differentiation. So we would just, we would always look at the brick, a brick sample before approving any brick and look the, at the color. It's in the staff sure. recommendations and, and a condition of the project that the staff approve the brick. Sure, I agree. I think your call, it was the color. Yeah. I just yeah. wanted to clarify where our conversation was going. So I mean, if the commissioners have thoughts about red brick versus um, a more tan brick, we would be happy to hear those. Do we want to talk about it? Mm -hmm. I, I, I prefer not having millions of, you know, lots of different colors on building uh, and, and different materials, so I'll defer to your, uh, you and Fred um, on that, but I would, my personal taste is not, is not for tan brown, but that, that's it. I do think there is something that can go back to the Department of Interior standards that an addition should look like an addition. So, so it gives you the ability to to do a different brick than what's on the on the existing. So. Uh, based on that, I make a uh, uh, make a motion on this 1239 Sixth Avenue North that we approve this project with the conditions and the staff recommendation. There is a motion. Second. There's a second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. Non-opposition. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I think we're there. Edge Hill. <laughs> Next up is a request to expand the Eastwood Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. Oh. With a section. Eastwood, okay. I'm sorry? Oh, I thought you had Edge Hill first, but Eastwood. Yeah, Eastwood, yes. With a neighborhood that is similar in architectural styles and forms as existing overlay, Melissa Baldock put together a terrific history of the area, which is in your report. This will be the third expansion for this overlay. The expansion meets criteria two and three of section 17.36.120 of the ordinance for its association with important figures in Nashville's history and its 1900 to 1965 architecture showing the evolution of architectural design from the classical styles to bungalows to post-war minimal traditional forms. Staff suggests that the commission recommend approval of the Eastwood Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay Expansion, finding it to meet criteria two and three of section 17.36.120. And in addition, staff recommends the adoption of the existing design guidelines for the Eastwood Neighborhood to uh, guide future changes in this expanded area, finding that they're consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards. And Councilman Withers is here. Councilman. <coughs> Thank you, again. thank you again, Commissioners. Uh, I am Councilmember Brett Withers, representing the Sixth District, and this um, is a uh, uh, hopefully final step of the multiple phased uh, expansions of the Eastwood Conservation Overlay, uh, and that is my own neighborhood at Eastwood. Um, and we um, had, uh, when I was the neighborhood president uh, several years ago, had conducted a pretty uh, large expansion of, of our overlay, which used to sort of have kind of fingers. It was oddly constructed um, when it had been uh, expanded, I think, in 07. So in uh, 12 and 13, we worked with a lot of our neighbors to expand it uh, pretty much all the way over to Porter Road. Um, we're able to add in a few houses that faced Porter on the east side. Uh, and then unfortunately, um, we uh, had not had a lot of communication uh, with the, the folks who live east of Porter in, in this area at that time. And so it did not make sense to file, uh, to include that area uh, in the expansion proposal that 
that, that took place uh, in the council in 2013. Uh, nevertheless, uh, we have been having conversations with some of those neighbors since that time. Um, the owner of the McCarn House, which is at the upper left, um, still owns that house and is has been very supportive of overlay protections in the area. Um, after the passage of the contextual overlay ordinance, uh, this area was included in one of the first applications of a contextual overlay, um, primarily for the Rolling Acres neighborhood to the south, um, th whose buildings are um, uh, sort of mi primarily mid-century post post World War II, but early post post World War II buildings that would not have contributed, at least at that time, for a conservation overlay. So neighbors did want to provide some protection in this area and did apply for a contextual overlay, which sits on most of this area presently. Um, as we know, the uh, only overlays that prevent against demolition of historic houses are the conservation overlays. So we are continuing to see um, demolitions of structures within contextual overlays. It still allows duplex construction um, with some uh, guidance, uh, but uh, neighbors are very interested in saving a lot of these historic houses, and I, I really appreciate, appreciate that effort. Um, in particular, like I said, the owner of the McCarn House, uh, which almost all of this area was originally the yard of that property. So I uh, really want to thank the staff for their work on the history of the area. Um, I know a little bit about the area, but uh, I learned a, a whole lot. The uh, What is today Eastwood was platted in, as sort of the town of Brownsville in 1855, and some of the, the streets um, in the neighborhood uh, retained their original names in a few cases. Um, so it's really interesting to see how that uh, uh, this part of the neighborhood in particular developed over a little bit later period of time than the, than the rest of our neighborhood did. Um, as is often the case, the oldest houses generally in the area are those closest to where the original streetcar line was that went up Porter Road and ended there at Greenwood. Uh, there was a streetcar turnaround at that area. So a lot of the oldest houses are closest to that. Um, but uh, I just really enjoyed all the detail going through the multiple waves of replatting of the, what used to be this one yard, uh, one property, uh, up to and including the, the very, very early 1960s. Um, in Eastwood as a whole, particularly to the West, um, our period of historic significance ends around World War II. Um, it's, and what we find is that we do have some of these uh, kind of early post-World War II houses, um, uh, minimal traditional style, that we love and want to keep in our neighborhood. But unfortunately, in the rest of our neighborhood, they do not meet the um, design guidelines for protection. And so we've lost a few of those. Uh, we in Eastwood like to think of ourselves primarily as a cottage neighborhood and really want to keep our cottages generally. And um, I'm really uh, um, appreciative of the work the staff did that showed uh, how, in some cases, these, these buildings that are a little bit more recent than what you typically see in conservation overlays are, are actually part of the historic fabric of the neighborhood um, and that we have uh, quite a bit of support from the property owners for including even some of those properties, um, which would be considered contributing. Um, the contextual overlay, as as it applies to this particular area, uh, number one, again, does not protect historic structures from demolition, but it, um, the contextual overlay uh, guides either new construction or additions to houses based upon uh, lot coverage, so percentage of lot coverage. And what you find in when you look at this area on Metro Maps is that uh, unlike a lot of your typical sort of neighborhood maintenance policy areas that had a, a fairly consistent uh, lot platting, that these lot sizes and shapes very uh, dramatically uh, within this area. And so in some cases that provides, uh, that can be a little bit of a pinch point if you happen to have a house that's on one of the very, very, very small lots. It's conceivable that you uh, would be quite limited even as to what kind of an, addi an addition you would use just based on what, uh, the, what your percentage of lot coverage is relative to your neighbors who may have a huge lot, for example. So that mathematical approach um, doesn't always serve uh, these particular homeowners very well. Uh, and I've had conversations with some folks even, even today that with the lot configurations being a little bit more fluid than what we would usually see, um, with the um, fairly 
uh, eclectic uh, house, housing styles uh, with houses being placed on the lots in a lot of different ways. I actually feel as though the uh, conservation overlay is more beneficial to a lot of these homeowners, especially if they wanted to do an addition, because there would be uh, there would be uh, an opportunity to come before the board and, and work with the staff to look at you know how that works within the overall street. Uh, so sometimes things that wouldn't ordinarily be approved in the rest of Eastwood, you know, really might be approved in this area. So again, I, I actually feel as though uh, while it prevents demolition, um, that it um, the conservation overlay application is a little bit more beneficial to these homeowners in resolving some of those uh, lot variance issues that arise that otherwise they would have to go through the Board of Zoning Appeals for. Um, so uh, I uh, think we have a few neighbors who are here today um, for, for this one, not, not, not as many as for another district, but uh, I just uh, appreciate the, the neighbors who have been advocating for historic preservation uh, for this area for, for many, many years. And I, I'm glad that we've got it to a point where I feel comfortable bringing it before this body and the Planning Commission and the Council uh, for in, uh, inclusion. And um, I, I actually am, you know, if you look, for example, to the building at the lower right-hand corner, uh, we're losing a lot of those structures uh, in East Nashville and they're being replaced by very, very large structures, even in conservation overlays. So it's great that we're taking some steps where we may have an opportunity to save some of these kind of starter homes that really are an important part of the history of development of our community. So with that, I will um, rest for now. Um, but if you have any questions for me, please let me know. Um, and I would, I'll be happy to save a couple minutes for final comment after the public hearing. Thank you, council member. Okay, so um, we are gonna open public hearing and how about this, because if you've got a, quite a few people, if you are, um, we're gonna mix it up. So whether you're pro or not pro, um, please stand, say your name and address. So please get in line <laughs> so we can move this along. Thank you. And you have two minutes. I'll be quick. Um, Colin Sutker, One Waters Avenue. Um, it is a great neighborhood. Uh, me and my family have lived here for the past seven years. Um, and we got young kids and a dog, and so we walked the neighborhood a lot. And before, we came right before, I think a lot of the development in the neighborhood took place. And there is a, um, there's a charm, there's a look, there's a feel to the neighborhood uh, that is, is really special. Um, and this overlay would really help maintain that. Now, we're not against development. I think there are some houses that, you know, could certainly, and some lots that could be improved. Um, and we're not against that. Uh, we just want to make sure um, that anything that does get built, um, you know, retains the, the charm and the character of the neighborhood. That's all we're looking for here. Uh, we're not looking to keep people from, you know, improving their lots or making it overly difficult to. Um, we just feel that there needs to be some protection because there is the pressure and you see it if you walk through the neighborhood you'll you'll see it um, we bought our house uh, two years ago and within two weeks we had developers coming to us asking us to as a, it's a beautiful house to you know to buy a lot you know ostensibly to tear it down and build other stuff so um, these houses still are not financially in terms of value, valuable enough to keep people from buying them um, and prevent them from, from knocking them down and building other stuff up there that would not match the neighborhood. And I can only guess they wouldn't match the neighborhood because I've seen what they have been building and it's, it's just ain't good. So uh, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Marcia Silsby. I live at 818 Powers. I've lived at um, bought the house uh, 27 years ago and still live there and am concerned about what's going on on my street two doors down. I have the twin towers that um, uh, overlook everything. And now I know they can't build twin towers, but they can build lot long and skinnies instead of tall and skinnies. The house, I own the empty lot next to my house and the house next to that has been bought and they are um, going to restore 
that, it's, tip, it's similar to the one on the upper right hand, but on the same side of the street, there's a boarded up house, and there's a house that um, is for sale by owner, one of the small houses, and what is going to go there will be a duplex or a lot long and skinnies instead of tall and skinnies, and it doesn't fit with the neighborhood where most of the houses are smaller and affordable. It was my starter house in 1990, and I'm still there, and so I do love the neighborhood, and I just want to make sure that I'm not enveloped with tall and ug or long and ugly. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you. My name is Brian Williams. I live at 814 McCarn. I also own the house at 812 McCarn, and also the house at 22 uh, Waters, um, which are investment properties that I own. But uh, I just, I want to reiterate that, uh, you know, I've lived there for about 12 years, but I want to reiterate that I'm, you know, interested in keeping the character of the neighborhood. There's been a lot of development, especially in the Rolling Acres area, I think, because, you know, we're located close to a very um, popular area, but there's some less restrictions there. So anything to, you know, just have some thoughtful development there, I would appreciate. Thanks. Thank you. Council member. All right, with that, if you have no questions for me, I would urge your approval. Thank you. Stick by. <laughs> All right, close public hearing. Commissioners. I would just, which Melissa did this report? It was so interesting. Um, I actually sent it to my dad because he's, I mean, he, my dad grew up here, not in East Nashville, but, and I don't know, he just loves the history of Nashville and I'd never seen any of these old stuff, so it was just really interesting. So I just wanted to say kudos to you for just great report. Um, very interesting, but also just thorough for making sure that this does fit in, you know, or does apply to the, to have an expansion. And so I think, you know, I was thoroughly convinced and, and I'm, I fully support it. Well, I'm going to jump out there to say I move that we recommend approval of the uh, Eastwood uh, Conservation Overlay Expansion. Second. Two. Are there two two ports to I'll, this? I'll move. Um, yeah. Actually, let's vote on that. Do have a motion? Yep. You have a second. Yes. I'll say all in favor. Wait. Were you going to say something? Or, uh, oh, uh, I'll say that. Hear the motion. Okay. All right. There's a first and a second, and. Aye. Aye. No. Aye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. There's no opposition. So, Commissioner, with Thank respect you. to the guidelines for the Eastwood expansion, I would recommend approval and adoption, given that uh, this board has just approved the nomination for the expansion of the district um, per staff's recommendation. Motion. I'll second that. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. No opposition. Thank you. Thank you to the neighborhood and to council member for being patient and waiting for us through this uh, process. Have a good night. Next up is the request for a new neighborhood conservation zoning overlay that includes Villa Place and portions of South Street, Grand Avenue, Tremont Street, and Edge Hill Avenue. The draft design guidelines have been available online for approximately two months. However, we have made a couple of changes, so I, I noted those in your staff report. On page 25, additional flexibility is possible for outbuildings on lots that back up to commercial areas, and we added the period of significance to page 18. The architectural resource study was conducted by the Center for Historic Preservation at MTSU, led by Katherine Hatfield. I wanted to thank her for all the hard work that she did and her colleagues did that otherwise would have had to been done or paid for by the neighborhood. The neighborhood has a really interesting history, developing into a middle-class African-American community after the Civil War, and a more complete report is in your, um, more complete history is in your report, again, that Katherine Hatfield put together. The neighborhood meets criterion three of section 17.36.120 of the ordinance for its turn of the century architecture and criterion one for its association with the development of an early Nashville African American neighborhood. Staff suggests that the commission recommend approval of the Edge Hill Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay, finding it to meet sections one and three, and staff recommends the adoption of the draft design guidelines proposed for the new district, finding that they are consistent with the Secretary of Interior standards. 
and this overlay actually spans two different councilman, council districts. Um, Councilman O'Connell is here if you have questions for him. Council Member O'Connell, you are up. Good afternoon, commissioners. Um, I am here today to speak in favor of the proposed Edge Hill Neighborhood Conservation Overlay District. I uh, learned to play piano at the W.O. Smith School when it was still in a beautiful old house on Edge Hill Avenue right at the edge of District 19. As a child, I also often went swimming at the Rose Community Center during summers, so I have a lifetime of experience with this one square mile community. As I was knocking on doors and visiting with residents of Edge Hill throughout the summer of 2015, I heard dire concerns about the future of this historic diverse neighborhood. Many residents felt as if the Nashville Next planning process overlooked uh, clearly expressed community preferences in a detailed neighborhood design plan. So they took action, engaging myself and Councilmember Sledge, uh, who is traveling today and couldn't be here, but he represents District 17 who, uh, and encompasses primarily the portions of Edge Hill south of Edge Hill Avenue and east of 12th Avenue South, uh, and our borders uh, share a boundary along most of Edge Hill Avenue. Working with the planning liaison in the Metro Council office, we addressed one early concern, walkability as a function of character uh, by changing the base zoning of most R6 parcels to an alternative zoning that encourages maintenance of existing sidewalk networks. We did that early last year, but the deeper character issue remained. Multiple stakeholders continue to discuss how to address it, considering another neighborhood design plan, an urban design overlay, and eventually settling on a neighborhood conservation overlay district, which we are here today to discuss. I'm happy to be here in support of the tool that many residents agree is the best way to ensure that this neighborhood is preserved in an era of unprecedented growth in Nashville. Uh, you will observe today that there is not consensus. The basis of Nashville Next incorporated a growth and preservation map, and the ideas of growth and preservation are very much in tension in Edge Hill. After nearly two years of conversation, though, I am comfortable that enough residents support this overlay district to bring it through a formal public process. There are ongoing conversations about the details of the boundary, and I'll be paying close attention to your deliberations, the deliberations of the Planning Commission, and the continuing conversation among residents and property owners in the neighborhood. Uh, thank you all for your service and your consideration of this proposed neighborhood conservation overlay district. Uh, unfortunately, at the lateness of this hour, I've got to uh, go across town to another community meeting. I'll probably be paying attention on the Metro Nashville network, um, but if there are any questions from commissioners, happy to accept those now. Council member, also, there's some more public hearing that's going to happen, so right. there's some engagement community as well. So we're I'll, and I'll, I'll have to pay attention to that in, in absentia and later on. Um, okay. But yeah, we've had you know plenty of public process about this so far. Uh, obviously, you can't uh, have 100% reach to every property owner, but um, I'm sure you will hear from plenty of members of the public today. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir, for your um, efforts and work as well for our city. Okay, so we are open for public hearing. And uh, let me just give a preface, you've got two minutes. And if you think somebody's gonna say the same thing, um, but we wanna honor you and how you wanna speak because you have waited this late. So uh, if we could just move it along, we all would appreciate it. So thank you very much. Good evening, I'm Jill Bader and the owner and resident at 1220 Villa Place and I'm here to mark my opposition to an overlay and request a deferral of a decision. I believe there needs to be more time for community education as the overlay was filed in my opinion prematurely before a, sh a full survey of neighbors had been completed and everyone's voice was heard. Just yesterday I spoke to many neighbors not on our email chains or message boards confused by this very process. The wrong location of this meeting was communicated to neighbors by the commission, causing even more confusion. As of last correspondence by the Pro Overlay Group on May 17th, it was communicated that 77 people were marked in favor of an overlay. I'm not sure if there are 77 homes or 77 people, but regardless, that means only approximately 30% of the homes that would be affected have been marked in support. Yes, this is, so yes. I ask you to hold until the vice chair is returned. You may. Thank you. Sorry, I have a I flight. Have That's why. <laughs> Sorry to, to Will my time be reset? Okay.
Okay, it, great. We pause. I ask staff to Thank go you. ahead and stop the meeting right at this juncture because we don't have a chair or a vice chair of this meeting at this point. Um, the vice chair had to step out, and I wanted to make sure that everyone was aware as to what all the input was um, because that could subject you to potential um, legal action if action is taken by people who were not privy to all of the information that was shared at the time. <laughs> And may I ask for my clock to be restarted to begin again because there's so much happening? I'll speak quick. Thank you. Okay, take two, <laughs> no worries, I understand. Good afternoon, I am Jill Bader and the owner and resident at 1220 Villa and am here to mark my opposition to an overlay and request a deferral of a decision. I believe there needs to be more time for community education as the overlay was filed before a full survey of neighbors had been completed and before everyone's voice was heard. Just yesterday I spoke to many neighbors not on our email chains or message boards, confused by this very process. The wrong location of this meeting was communicated to neighbors by the commission, causing even more confusion. As of the last correspondence by the Pro Overlay Group on May 17th, it was communicated that 77 people were marked in favor of an overlay. I'm not sure if there are 77 homes or 77 people, but regardless, that means only approximately 30% of the homes that would be affected have been marked in support. This is not even close to an overwhelming majority. I am a Nashville native and I purchased a home without an HOA or other restrictions with the intent to stay and raise a family. For over 100 years, the members of our community have changed their homes to accommodate their changing families. Many of you or your previous owners to your homes have already done so. I want the same freedoms for my family. I appreciate and I love the, rich, the rich history of Edge Hill. That's why I chose to live here. I value my neighbors' concerns behind me about a growing, changing community of Edge Hill in our growing, changing Nashville. A neighborhood is more than our buildings, it's our people. And as such, I wanna work on efforts with these concerned neighbors that we can all agree on, like safety and community. Purchasing a home in a community with known restrictions is one thing. Forcing new restrictions on existing neighbors like me who do not want them, like this does, saddens and frustrates me. I respectfully request this overlay to be voted down or deferred. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Mike Slarve. I own 1508 Edge Hill. Um, I'm, I'm torn uh, because I like the idea of preserving the looks of the buildings. 
However, in my case, and I know in several people's cases here, uh, I'm wedged between two new buildings, one uh, right across the street from Taco Mamacita. So one is a big square building that I don't even know how it got approved, but it sits on the very edges of the property and supposedly it's a single family dwelling. However, they have, I think, six bathrooms and I believe that they rent all the rooms out. Uh, there's always at least six cars there. And then there's my house, which was built in uh, 1906, which is a craftsman style and I, I love the house. Then the, ne the houses next to me was just torn down and I have two uh, about 3,000 square foot uh, homes that are built on the same size lot as mine. However, they're three stories high. Uh, your, so I'm kind of in the shadow of both these buildings. One's two stories high, one's three stories high. So I would like you to consider, uh, and I like the idea of the overlay. Uh, I like the idea of the architectural um, uh, flow that everything should look, you know, try to keep the look of, uh, preserve the look of the buildings and the styles, etc. However, I'd like you to consider a, uh, either some type of a variance, uh, depending on people's uh, uh, situations, in that if I wanted to expand uh, or build another house on my house, I have no problem uh, conforming to the architectural design. Uh, however, if you limit me to a, a one and a half stories, basically I'm stuck between these big two buildings and I don't feel that it's fair uh, to me uh, to have to do that. Once again, I don't have a problem complying with the looks of the you, building. Your limit. Thank you. I'm sorry? Your two minute limit. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Thank you. I didn't Thank you. That. Thank you. Hi, my name is Allison Schachter, and I live at 1022 Villa Place, and I'm here to speak in favor of the neighborhood conservation overlay. I'm proud to live in such a historic neighborhood that was central to the history of the African American community in Nashville, and I love walking the streets of my neighborhood and the character, the historic character that surrounds me. This is a neighborhood that is, it is by and large untouched, but surrounded by many forces of development that are changing rapidly, and I think this would help to protect the neighborhood and I just want to also say that I'm really grateful to all of my neighbors for the work that they've put into this overlay and in bringing the, the rich history of this neighborhood. So I hope that you will help to preserve this. That's a really cool t-shirt too. Thanks. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ashley Shoemaker. I'm a resident and owner at 1500 South Street and that's one of the streets that's been debated on whether it should be included. So I just wanted to make sure you know that most of us and there's others here today um, that our residents of South Street are in favor. It's a large street with the big tree line median that we've worked really hard to restore and it um, has a lot of character and a lot of beautiful historic homes. We're very concerned that we're already on the edge of um, some zoning changes and um, that if we are left off the overlay, we'll be very vulnerable to a lot of changes and would, lead, would lose the characteristics that made us want to live um, in this neighborhood. And we've been residents since 2009. So thanks. Thank you. Hi, my name is Charles Howe, and I am a resident, I owner at 1009 15th Avenue South. I'm representing six of the nine African American families that still live on uh, 15th on the lower part, well, the upper part, I guess, from Edge Hill going towards town, because two of the families I wasn't able to speak with uh, yet. Uh, I bought my house in 1993. It was a crack and prostitution house that had been condemned, and my renovation of that house turned the neighborhood around. I welcome all the new neighbors that have come in, but speaking on behalf of the African-American families that are still there, they're mainly in small houses, and they have no intention, we have no intention of, of moving, probably die in our houses, but we don't want to feel that our kids are going to be penalized, that they won't be able to do what they would like to do in the house uh, that, you know, the people that are left. Um, we just feel that this, this process has been by you know, pushed by new people coming into the neighborhood 
and um, we haven't been consulted. We haven't been able to put our input into it. Uh, we feel that we should be allowed an opportunity to participate or to opt out of this entirely. Uh, if, a, if a majority of our neighbors on our street decide that they don't want to do it, our street is two blocks long, we wish we could just not participate. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is Trey Fanjoy. Uh, my family and I own the house at 1722 15th Avenue South. Uh, I'm extremely involved and active member in the music industry and our community. Uh, I want to say first that I love our city. I have a tremendous amount of respect for the commission and the work that you guys are doing to protect and preserve the integrity of our city. But I have to say that at this point in time, I strongly oppose an overlay. And for much of the reasons that Jill Bader, one of the first women that spoke here, uh, I do not believe that the information has been properly disseminated and I don't think that we really have have a consensus, and we certainly don't have a majority. Uh, I will tell you that I know how busy I am as a working mother. Uh, my, I've left numerous messages for my project lead to just get understanding. This is all new to me, this process. I have not been able to get the information that I need. Now, my family and I own a very small brick house. It's around 800 square feet. It's on an extremely busy high traffic corner, right on the, right on the corner of 15th and Wedgwood. And um, we were directly across from Belmont. So a stoplight and a crosswalk walk were built on our land, literally. Uh, they made a mistake and they encroached on our property line. So the view from our front porch is now a big stoplight, a big crosswalk, and a big electrical box. And Belmont added a new structure that's also within view of my property. And the blasting that they did for months to create their building and their underground parking structure really destroyed our house. I, we have so many cracks in our foundation, it has really left our building kind of in, in a really bad, sad situation. We have serious sewage issues, which has been an ongoing problem with odors. Um, and adjacent to my property, directly behind our backyard Your is, limit. is a four-unit apartment complex. Your limit. Thank you. So Thank I you. ask that you guys to please review more carefully. Hello, uh, my name's Rob Benchoff. I, I live at 916 14th Avenue South. I also own a home at 1016 15th Avenue South, which is in the overlay. And uh, I'm here to represent the Edge Hill Coalition and our proposal for a neighborhood conservation zoning overlay. Um, so the Edge Hill Coalition, the organizations within the Edge Hill Coalition are the Organized Neighbors of Edge Hill, ONE, Edge Hill Village Neighborhood Association, Edge Hill Neighborhood Partnership, Edge Hill United Methodist Church, Salaman, Salama Urban Ministries, Watson Grove Baptist Church, and Walk Bike Nashville. So um, at this point, let's see, I guess we, everyone's here that uh, we can get everybody to stand up who supports the overlay. So all right, like it's a little bit hard to tell for some of them are in line. <laughs> And a lot of these people are the people that went out and canvassed. So on three separate occasions, we went out and we uh, canvassed the neighborhood, everyone in the overlay area. And we left flyers in the mailboxes and on doors, you know, to get people to come to these three different public meetings. And that began, let's see, the first time we canvassed was on, was in September of 2017. We formed our overlay committee in uh, March of 2017. And the first thing we did was we looked at all kinds of different overlays and we decided that the conservation overlay was the best way to preserve the history of the homes within Edge Hill. So, uh, and I thought that uh, Commissioner Withers did a great job of comparing the conservation overlay with the contextual overlay, overlay and the benefits of the conservation overlay for one thing. All right. So uh, we have uh, lots of very important historic homes within Edge Hill. Um, let's see. One example would be the Blakemore House on South Street, which uh, M.G. Blakemore was the first African-American in the Tennessee State Legislature in 1966. 
And I know that, um, let's see, in order to gain the approval for this overlay, it must meet at least one of the five criteria of section 17.36.120, and we appreciate the staff's finding that the overlay meets criteria one and three, uh, but we feel with the Blakemore House, we actually uh, might meet the second criteria. And that second criteria says uh, it is associated with the lives of persons significant in local, state, or national history. Natural, yeah, national history. So we feel that it, uh, it meets that. And of course, under an overlay, as we've seen throughout this meeting this evening, you can change your home if you live in an overlay. And actually, uh, Robin Ziegler did a great job with the guidelines, making it possible to add front dormers, raise your roof line, or, or, you know, she worked with the guidelines to, to make it as flexible as possible. And um, other parts of the guidelines that have to do with the new development on Music Row, um, so that people could work with their outbuildings on the rear of their property. So we feel like this is a very flexible overlay. And we feel that um, time's running out, you know. We're losing a lot of historic homes in Edge Hill. And we may not have this opportunity again. We may lose too many homes, and we may not have this opportunity if we don't do it this time. So that's all I have to say. Thank you. Okay. I'm um, just going to clarify that the uh, Edgeville Neighborhood Coalition got five minutes instead of two because it is a group um, group co co cooperative versus two minutes. Gotcha. Um, I'm Isaiah Carney. I live at uh, 1024 15th Avenue South. Um, I've lived there for 21 years. My family's been there for 24. Uh, I was born 21 years ago, so. Um, we, our house was built in 1986, and we've done multiple renovations trying to make it look, uh, trying to really fit in with the look of the uh, neighborhood, and we think it's a really beautiful um, neighborhood, but we're opposed to the historic overlay um, because it would put restrictions on that would make it really difficult for us to do um, and unaffordable to do um, uh, <laughs> renovations in the future, and we want to be able to do that our, on our own if we can. Um, so I don't really have a lot to say, but I'm saying our family is opposed to it. So thank you. Good afternoon, members of the commission. Uh, my name is Bill Harbison. Uh, I'm at 153rd Avenue South. I am the manager of a limited liability company called Shatton 3 LLC that owns 1514 South Street. It's a uh, a commercial property, it's a business on South Street uh, near the Music Row area. And I'm here to say, register our opposition to this overlay. Um, uh, Shatton Properties uh, does not join in the, the desire to be restricted in any way. They've operated a business on that property for s some years now. And my, I don't want to reiterate the things other folks have said. I do want to point out two things from your rules of order and procedure that were adopted in April of this year. The first is on page four under 7A, and it's 7A3, that the commission, when considering um, something of this nature, uh, I think should consider an architectural inventory, including float photographs and slides of the properties to be designated. I have not seen such a thing. I looked at the staff report. I've not seen any kind of architectural inventory. We would suggest our property does not meet the requirements for that. And the second, I would point out, second criteria I would point out is on page five, under review criteria B2, uh, the extent of the agreement or on design guidelines for the district or landmark between the commission and the neighborhood group, property owners, and others to be affected. I would suggest that there's no record at this point of any agreement. I think even the councilman acknowledged there's not consensus about what to do in this area. And so that important factor, I think, should be considered by the board. Thank you.
My name is Thomas Palmieri. I live at 14 cents, 1410 South Street. We've lived in the neighborhood for 12 years. We're in strong support of this uh, overlay. We live in fear of houses nearby being torn down and ter being turned into three-story party towers. Uh, if I could trust the developers to come in and do sensible development, we wouldn't need an overlay, but we've seen what's happened to our, our, our neighborhood. Something needs to be, needs to be done to, to protect the historic uh, structures in our neighborhood. Thank you. Hello, I'm Lucas Chestnut. I'm the owner of 1409A Tremont Street. Um, I'm here to ask you to uh, propose a deferral of this uh, overlay. I'm uh, in favor of opposing what's per currently proposed, but I'm willing to help out and form a steering committee of those who are opposed as well as for to try to work something out. Because right now we are divided and I think to move forward um, would not serve uh, at least a majority of the neighborhood. Uh, but I think that people can work together, um, whether they're for or against. Um, I think people are willing to work together. Even though people are against or for it, I've talked to them and had good discussions. And I respect their positions and respect the purpose of this board. Um, if this board decides to move forward, um, and not consider defer or not uh, move for deferral. Um, I would ask that you remove 1508 Edge Hill through 1518 Edge Hill from the map. Uh, 1508 spoke earlier and ran out of time, but he and I spoke, um, and he is uh, oh in favor of removal. Um, 1512, 1514, 1516 are in favor, uh, 1508's in a contributing home, but is in favor of removing his home from the map. Um, the other end of Edge Hill had two homes removed from it. Um, and so there's not, especially at 1512, or 15, uh, 1512, 1510 on, there's only one contributing house. On Tremont, starting with our house at 1409 Tremont, um, through 1507 Tremont, there's only one contributing house. <clears throat> so out of those 11 properties, there are only two or three contributing houses, and one of those is wanting to be removed. So there's only two houses, and I tried to reach them, but I couldn't. So <clears throat> I would ask you to remove our section from the map, because I don't think it qualifies. I don't think the block from 1514, 1518 Edge Hill, and um, 1503 to 1507 Tremont uh, would even qualify, because there's not enough contributing homes on the block. Thank you. Hi, my name is Doug Colton. Um, I own 1506 South Street, and I'm here to talk to you about the South Street border. Uh, earlier, Ashley Shoemaker said that most of the people on South Street were, and she's at 1500 South Street, said that they were in favor of this when it's absolutely not true. The great majority is opposed to South Street being part of this. In fact, um, Ashley and her husband just tore down a historic home and rebuilt their big new home. And now they want to prevent the rest of us from being able to have the rights that we had. Um, 1400 and 1402 South Street, which are the, uh, the east, northeast boundary of this, have already been removed from the map. We've asked that 1514 through 1502, which is the northwest corner of this, be removed from the map. And we've been asking for months and months and months. Uh, we asked Robin. Robin said, well, that's Freddie's decision. Freddie said the Historic Commission can make that decision. Um, so he, I'm here asking that 1514 through 1502 be removed from the map. All but one of those property owners has signed the petition against the overlay, and the only one re remaining one says he's a maybe, and we're not sure. Um, so I wanted to uh, bring that to your attention and formally ask that you remove those properties from the map. Thank you. Hello, my name is Paul. I live at 1011 15th Avenue South. Uh, my neighbor, Charles, lives at 1009 15th Avenue South. He spoke earlier. I'm also in opposition to the overlay, and I don't want to speak out of turn for any neighbors, but he did cite several neighbors on 15th Avenue South, I believe the majority of the block that wanted to be removed, and I would be in favor of that as well. 
Good evening, my name is Carolyn Rambo. I re reside at 3801 Dartmouth Avenue, but I'm here on behalf of my father, David Yates, who owns property at 1502 South Street and has for 32 years since 1986. I would like to request that we uh, at least get a recommendation to Councilman O'Connell to remove the northwestern corner of South Street, as Mr. Colton uh, recommended. These homes from 1514 to 1502 are opposed to the overlay, except for 1510, which is a non-contributing home. All of these properties currently we have a very large five-story building that is being built right behind them. And despite our requ repeated requests for this removal, there has been resistance removing the street and we were told to work out a compromise when we found out that 1400 and 1402 had already been removed. It led to some confusion and frustration. Um, if you would please keep in mind, my father is very elderly and my mother is seriously ill. He is a retired veteran and absolutely does not want his home in the overlay. He is renting the home now, but however, for medical reasons, he could potentially need to move back there in the future. Thank you for listening to me on behalf of my father. I hope you will have compassion for him and honor this request. Um, my name is Joel Dark. I live at 1027 15th Avenue South, and that is a contributing uh, structure within the proposed overlay. Um, I strongly support the con conservation overlay, partly for um, reasons others have mentioned. Uh, we are seeing a lot of changes in Edge Hill. Um, houses are going in that are inappropriate uh, for the character of the neighborhood and uh, overshadow, literally, in some cases, um, our homes. Um, my primary reason for supporting the overlay Way, however, is the African American history of the neighborhood. Um, Edge Hill is surrounded by numerous National Register listed historic sites and areas, including the Belmont Mansion, Belmont Hillsboro Historic District, the Falls School, the Waverly Place Historic District, and hopefully soon also the Music Row Historic District. We are also surrounded by conservation overlays. Um, the houses in Edge Hill, many of them, particularly in this area, and um, in some other areas of the neighborhood have the same age architectural significance um, as the structures in these other neighborhoods. And they're also connected to almost 200 years um, of African American history, um, extending from the period before the Civil War um, to the present. The very existence of Edge Hill attests to the successful efforts by African Americans beginning immediately after the end of slavery to build neighborhoods that thrived, survived segregation, and urban renewal and were intrinsic to the achievement of a diverse democracy in Nashville. And so, I, I mean, Edge Hill is really worthy of the same protection and honor as the neighborhoods um, that surround it. Um, and particularly the western part of Edge Hill um, is the place where architecture connects us to that 200-year history. Thank you. Good afternoon, Commissioners. I'm Ronnie Miller, and I first want to thank you for your time that you dedicated today on this long day. Uh, I live at 905 Villa Place. I was raised and born on Villa Place. I have a lot of history with Villa Place. My family has lived on Villa since the 40s, early 40s, and thankful they had a mindset of knowing about history and preservation. I had some people that were good that thought that I needed to know about preservation and history. A lady that I helped take her groceries in as a child allowed me to purchase her home, a Queen Anne home, 1890, had gas lights still in it when we bought it and still own the house now. My wife and I purchased it. We own several houses in this overlay and we think Edge Hill is a wonderful place. As a kid, I grew up throwing papers, the African paper. I met people like, you heard M.G. Blakemore. I heard W.O. Smith. These are all people that lived around. The first group of African American children to go on a field trip from Davidson County was taken by a principal who lived across the street from me. The first female banker, cashier 
in Davidson County, Helen Jordan, who worked for Citizens Bank and was employed by the boards, lives next door to me. So I had a real rich history of what Edge Hill could be. And we're looking for all of this to form, to bring together the we try to do the things that the commission wants to Thank pass you, the Mr. History Miller. Thank, Thank you. Thanks, Ronnie. Thank you to the commission. Uh, my name is Theo Antoniatis. I live at 1720 15th Avenue South. Um, there are a number of reasons why I support this overlay, but today I'm, I've been asked to speak, and I'm here to address um, criteria number two, um, the, the presence of structures within the proposed boundaries that um, are associated with the lives of persons significant in local, uh, state, and national history. Um, a few of them have already been mentioned, but I'll also add to that 1215 Villa Place, the home of Don Q. Pullen, a uh, well-known musician, composer, or an arranger, metro school leader of bands. The band shell in Hadley Park is named after him. And his home on Villa served as a place to stay for many notable traveling musicians at a time when there was only one hotel in Nashville that actually allowed African Americans to stay there. Uh, 1303 Tremont, the home of T. Clay Moore, prominent African American business person, advocate for the founding of Tennessee State, and a delegate to the Republican National Convention in 24, 1924. Uh, and we have 1501 and 1503 Edge Hill Avenue. <coughs> Um, home of Moses and Calvin McKissick of McKissick and McKissick. Founded in 1905, was the first African-American owned um, uh, architectural firm in the United States and is the oldest African-American owned architecture and engineering firm uh, in the country. And lastly, 1414 uh, Edge Hill, home of Braxton and Maddie Merle, um, the Merle schools named after him, acting principal of Pearl uh, High School. He wrote the Pearl Song, later the principal of Washington Junior High, and the house was later the um, the site for the W.O. Smith um, School of Music, which of course tons of people have gone through. Um, so these along with other homes um, uh, were built by, served as the homes and the meeting places of um, people who played significant roles we feel in shaping the history of Nashville and the country, and uh, we should do our part to save those. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joyce Harris. I live at 1401 Tremont Street. Um, I've lived there for 44 years. I've been given two dates for when our house was built, and that was 1926 or 1930. But I do know that our home has been in our family since 1939. And I'm here to support the neighborhood conservation. One, just as homeowners, we're excited about an opportunity to have some guidelines that will help us maintain the history of our community in terms of how it looks. But more importantly, we are very excited about being able to maintain the history of a community, a community that has been supported, has been supportive, that has been connected, that has helped us raise two productive citizens in this community. So again, I do want to thank you for your time, and I support the neighborhood conservation. Well, so good afternoon or good evening. I'm Terry Chapman, and I am the proud heir of the property of 1721 15th Avenue South, directly across the street from Belmont University. I remember the day that my grandmother and my grandfather, that they moved us into that house 47 years ago. I'm very proud of the neighborhood, and I live there now. I'm caring for my 76-year-old mother, who is adamant about staying in that neighborhood and preserving the property. So I am in favor of the conservation project, and I want to thank our neighbor, who always comes by and informs us of things that are going on. There are a lot of seniors that are in the neighborhood that do not know what's going on. I'm just going to be honest with you. I don't care who says that they've knocked on their door, they're not opening if they don't see a face that they recognize. And we need some more faces that these seniors will recognize and they'll open the door in their hearts to talk. So I am in favor of this overlay, but I do think that there, that there definitely is gonna have to be some more conversation with some of us residents who've been there for a long time. Thank you. Hello, everybody. <clears throat> My name is Andres Albert, and I've been in the neighborhood since 1998. I own 1220 Sigler, 1207 Sigler, 1211, 13, 15, 16, 17, 18, 
21, 1300 A, B, and C, and 1301 15th Avenue South. I've been in the neighborhood a long time. I pay $66,000 a year in, in property tax, which I'm still paying on it right now as we're speaking. Uh, I've made a big difference in the neighborhood. I remember back in 1998 when I came down there, most of my friends asked me, what am I doing here? I said, I'm here to make a difference, and I have. There's a lot of people are coming into the neighborhood, and people who have lived there have benefited tremendously off that neighborhood, especially have torn down, and they're still living there in the neighborhood. And so my thing is that, that I'm always, it's a good neighborhood, and it's changed a whole lot since I've been there too, and I've paid my dues. I've had 13 break-ins, and it's not been easy to live over there. And so, um, going back to historical African American, I've uh, met some of the neighbors of McKissick and McKissick. There were one of the houses, 1211. I took the old house, which was completely inhabitable to live in, and thank goodness I had the opportunity to tear it down and put a beautiful home on it right now, 1211 15th Avenue South, which helps the property value in the neighborhood. So my question is, why is the overlay now what we could have done it a long time ago? And so really what's gonna happen is that it's gonna keep changing it more, and, then, and so there's a lot of homes in there that really need to be torn down. It's just beyond, beyond me a little bit here on this anyway. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, stress my point that I'm paying a lot of property tax. I pay people's salaries here in this Howard School. Thank and you, I don't sir. like it. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I'm definitely, up, definitely not in favor of it. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tina Camp. I'm at 1607 Villa Place. I'm here to express my opposition to this overlay. I have been in this street 25 years when White Way was still a cleaners. So I've seen a lot of change, and I welcome change. But what I don't want to happen is not to be reserved in how I can address my property. I don't want to tear it down. I love my house. <clears throat> but I would like my freedom, as Jill first said, to have the same courtesy that people down the street have done. I walked this street yesterday looking at this house in your paperwork. This house now has an addition built up that would not conform. It didn't look bad. They made this house look beautiful. It added to the neighborhood. And the lady said, I'm so glad we did this before the conservation overlay came in. I also learned in my walking yesterday, there are a lot of people who don't understand what a conservation overlay is. There needs to be more education. They saw the signs, but they didn't know what they meant. This is not good for all of us as a neighborhood. There are those who are a, in pro and for it. I respect their opinion. I want my opinion respected as well. I am a neighbor. I pay my taxes, I live there, and I love Edge Hill Village area. And I appreciate you listening to all of us because we have a lot of opinions and we have a lot of heart in this. But we are all a neighborhood and we need to educate and we need to talk more. It's been very, I'm afraid, a little bit restrictive. And I thank you. Thank you. My name is Jan White, and I live at 1004 Villa Place. We have the really odd house that looks like a white church. Everyone thinks it is, but it wasn't. I've been an architectural designer for 35 years and worked on many projects throughout our country in different cities. I think that um, some preservation is good, but I am totally and 100% opposed to this overlay. In my opinion, uh, it, it's like we, we saved this house that we have because we thought it was worth saving. But if I had chosen to tear it, to tear it down or to have done something different to it, I think I had that right because when I bought it, I didn't sign on to any rules or regulations other than the normal rules and regulations of uh, 
a society. So anyway, I'm strongly opposed. And it sounds to me like, frankly, today, there are very many people that are opposed to this. And at the very least, I would ask you to defer this, because I don't think our voices are being heard. And I don't want to see it uh, tear the neighborhood apart either. You know, it's not like that, and I'm not saying there's not some validity in both sides, but I do ask you, please, to oppose this. Thank you. My name is Robert Murray. I live at 1004 Villa Place, and I want to commend you all on your ability to sit there that long. That's not something I could do. <laughs> But uh, I just have a couple points I'd like to make. I believe that this was done re on re a rather forced march and that it's moving a little faster than, than it should. And I'm taken aback by the placement on the agenda for July 3rd already for the, uh, for the commission. Uh, so that... I'm upset about that. I mean, that concerns me. And I believe that the support for the overlay has been overstated and oversold. I don't believe the true numbers are what, they, what they've been purported. Prove me wrong, but that's fine. And uh, lastly, I'd like to say that I heard someone talking the other day that real estate is you buy it in, in, in the future. You're buying the bundle of rights that you get at the time you close for the future. And for this then to go back and to deny uh, one of those rights, the right to do as I choose to with the house under the uh, knowing already that it has to meet codes, it just denies that one right that I think we have. Thank you. Hello, my name is uh, Janet Shands and I reside at 1001 14th Avenue South in a 30s bungalow and unfortunately, 14th, when they took the inventory of what was qualifying in our community, 14th, we didn't have enough contributing houses to be included in this. But I am part of an ownership group of two investment properties that are in the overlay area, 1712 Villa and 1514 Wedgwood. And as an investor, uh, there is always pause when you hear historic and an overlay. Oh my gosh, is this gonna hinder me in, in doing what I need to do and to make profit? And in my opinion, uh, all the, the, the scholarly studies that we've seen really indicate that over time, this really increases the value of the community. And we're not, it's the least restrictive overlay that we're asking for in the sense that we're not saying that every house has to look like a 30s bungalow. It can be a modern design. What we're asking for is scale and proportionality. You've heard from several people today, some of them developers who have built very large homes that they have sold, that are Airbnbs, that are huge boxes overshadowing us. And we're trying to hang on. This is a great community. This is a rich community, and the African American history is here. We are down to these 250 homes, and of any sense of that Edge Hill that has been there throughout the uh, 20th century and, and until today, uh, with all this historic value, this is an opportunity to preserve that in a less restrict, least, rest, least restrictive way we can. Um, that can be a win-win for everybody and with property values increasing over time because we do have protections in place. Thank you for your time, appreciate your service, and I hope that you can support us in this. Thank you. Hi, my name's Amy Colton and I'm a homeowner at 1506 South Street um, and I'm opposed to the overlay. Um, I would like to respectfully request that you defer this bill to give the community more time to discuss this overlay. Despite repeated requests, we've never been allowed to see the details of the overlay survey results. The opposition group doesn't believe the survey is an accurate reflection of those in favor or those opposed to the overlay. For example, that survey reflected 16 opposed to the overlay as of May 17th. However, we have 100 I repeat, 100 properties on a petition in opposition to this overlay, 100. 
That's a dramatic difference between what, between what we were told on that survey of 16 no's to where we are at 100 no's. Um, it's clear to me that there's not an agreement re uh, regarding the survey results uh, that the council members relied upon when filing this application. Um, I'd like to cite MHZC Rules of Procedure 7.B.2, which states for designating historic zoning districts, it's based on, quote, the extent of agreement on design guidelines for the district between the commission and the neighborhood group, property owners, and others to be affected by the designation. Please adhere to this. We have a petition with approximately 100 property owners against this overlay. Also, respectfully, please adhere to MHZC Rule of Procedure 7.8.1.3, which states an architectural inventory, including photographs and slides of the properties to be designated as part of the review criteria, and the staff report does not contain this. Finally, as has been requested numerous times in writing to me by Ms. Ziegler and to Councilman O'Connell, we would like the northwestern point of South, portion of South Street removed from the overlay map. This is 1514 through 1502 on the northwestern side. This is Bill Harbison's two properties he referred to earlier. Um, he's against it. 1510 is a non-conforming house that is undecided. 1508 through 1502 are all strongly opposed, and we have a five-story commercial office building dwarf our backyards. We only recently re learned that 1402 and 1400 South Street, two historic homes at the other end of South Street, Thank will move so from much. the overlay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I'm opposed. Thank you. Hello, my name is Daryl Harvey. I live at 1401 Edge Hill Avenue. Uh, I'm also in strong opposition of this overlay. Uh, the whole pro process has been pretty murky from ever since I moved in uh, in December, and there hasn't been very much uh, very much opportunity for those who are opposed to speak at all these uh, all these meetings that have gone uh, gone on. Only the last one were anybody was anybody in opposition even allowed to speak? We were always shuttled off like everybody in in uh, favor got a chance to speak and then it's like boom, time to go, clear the house. So it seems to me that we need to at the very least delay in voting, um, at the very least, if not just completely uh, eradicate this whole plan. It's This plan I believe is picking winners and losers People with lower means are effectively going to be priced out of any kind of profit opportunity when they either pass or uh, they decide to sell out. My next door neighbors, they're looking to sell right now because they're terrified that an overlay uh, is going to be able to, is going to stifle their opportunity to make money. They've been uh, residents for 40 years in the neighborhood. And here you are like basically picking who's going to profit and who can't profit. And with an overlay, there's no more affordable housing because only those with means are able to buy into the neighborhoods. So you're effectively gentrifying by just the definition of using an overlay. Plus, I don't know, we've been here almost four and a half hours. You guys are underpaid and overworked. I don't think you guys need more of a workload. I don't know, but that's just me. Thank you. My name is Batia Carabell. I currently reside at 2308 18th Avenue South, but I am building on the property at 1703 15th Avenue South. While my house at 1703 is not in the overlay, I believe that the house that was there tells the story of this neighborhood. Um, we were forced to demolish that home because of the disarray, that it, the disrepair that it had fallen into um, to, the, to the extent that the estate who owned the, the property couldn't um, maintain it or or repair it to to a, a livable condition, um, and so I believe that this this overlay there are ways to regulate things, um, to regulate conservation, to regulate things in different ways that may not necessarily. Um, be a conservation zoning overlay. Um, I also would like to point out that um, for the, for we've been here since I had to leave work at 1.30 p.m. today. I was only able to do that because my supervisor is on vacation. And um, I think that we need to recognize that the, um, 
the resources that are required to present to you all are, are extreme, um, both in time and finances, and I'm concerned about my neighbors who may not be able to do that. Um, so I believe that um, I am in strong opposition to this, to this plan, despite not being in the overlay. I think it does contribute to the neighborhood in which I'm very much looking forward to live. Hello, my name is Rodney King. I live at 907 Villa Place. Uh, the house was built in 1905. I'm strongly in favor of the overlay because with what is happening with our neighborhood, if we do not have some sort of protection, in 10 years our neighborhood won't exist. It will just be tall skinnies and it will be Airbnbs and there will be no historical connection to the past. So I'm in favor of this extremely. Thank you. Good afternoon and evening. My name is Daniel Green. Uh, my address is 2810 Columbine Place. Um, I, I own four properties within the proposed uh, overlay and just wanted to come and express and voice my opposition to the overlay. No other reasons than that have already, I don't need to restate what's already uh, been said, but I'm strongly opposed to the overlay. Thank you for your time today. Hello, my name is Edward Perez, and uh, my family and I own the house on 1722 15th Avenue South, and uh, we're absolutely opposed with this overlay, and uh, it just seems to me and to us, to many of us, that uh, there's just too much misinformation at this moment, uh, too much confusion, and uh, I request that this overlay be deferred. Uh, so that we can have the time to assess this. Uh, uh, people speak about setting precedents, and, and at the moment there's so much new construction it completely surrounds us. Um, and I'd like to urge for more clear assessment of the homes that will be affected. And uh, I believe that there needs to be more research uh, before this moves forward. Um, and as the gentleman said a few few a little little while ago uh, you know you make the investment for the future and to not be able to have the opportunity as your family grows to build up and to to add something beautiful to the community it's already happening it's a, this, I mean this conversation to me seems like it should have happened years ago and uh, so uh, thank you for your patience uh, obviously it takes a lot of patience to sit in those chairs and to listen to all of us but uh, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, I would like to uh, request uh, uh, that uh, we defer this if not completely lose this uh, whole plan so thank you very much appreciate it Hello, I'm Karen Caladimos, 907 Villa Place. Um, I've lived in my home for, since 2000, and I am strongly in favor of the overlay. I also work on the um, committee. So I've been one of the people that's been knocking on doors. <laughs> um, and we actually, our co the coalition, the neighborhood coalition was formed in December of 15. And we started in January of 16 looking at various tools and what we could do to protect our neighborhood. We had our first um, community overlay meeting was in December 15, 2016. We had another community meeting on September 6, 2017. And we had another community meeting on May 2, 2018. The coalition itself also has monthly meetings the third Thursday of every month, at which time often on the agenda is what's been going on with the overlay. We went out and canvassed three times. We've done a lot. But I want it because I want the sense of community that I have, and I don't want to have this haphazardness. I want to have a flow. I don't necessarily care that the house is new construction but there needs to be some requirements. These restrictions are not restrictive at all. They don't demand that you spend a lot of money or that you'll lose your home or anything like that. It's not, you guys initially like approved six houses all at once, six recommendations. So it's not even like everybody has to come here and hang out for five hours. <laughs> Thank you. 
Looks like I might be the last. So um, my name is Rachel Zilstra, and I live at 1015 Villa Place. I have a historic home that would be inside the map. Um, and I want to first thank Robin, who's been super helpful in this process, and the staff report, who clearly demonstrate that we are, that Edge Hill, or at least this portion of Edge Hill, is eligible for um, this type of zoning. We have 62% of the buildings are, are contribute. Um, and then, you know, if you've had a chance to read the report, um, we have this long, amazing African-American history that contributes to it also. So right, you know, right away I know that we're eligible for it and we ask that you, um, that you move ahead. Um, we have two more public meetings, um, but for this um, board we ask that you accept that. Um, but I also want to back up a little. I serve as the um, um, board president for the Edge Hill Village Neighborhood Association that represents the western boundary um, where, in fact, most of, all, I guess, all of um, the overlay map is included in that. Um, and I get to hear from residents about um, how much they love their urban, historic, walkable neighborhood. We have an incredible neighborhood with a long history. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna take two. I'll just take two. Yeah, but well, give me just a second because okay. she represents a neighborhood association. She gets five minutes. How many representatives does an association? We get? didn't get. We didn't get. The opposition five. got cut off. I got you, ten minutes. She's an established historic, I mean, she's an established neighborhood association. And but I only need two. Yeah, so the point is, I only need two. We, so. We're going to keep moving. We're going to keep moving. <laughs> okay. Um, anyway, I get to hear from neighbors how much they love their historic urban walkable neighborhood. But what I also hear again and again is how um, how we're losing so much of Edge Hill. Um, and I, I didn't know what to do about that. I would hear, I would listen, I would share. Um, but, uh, you know, there's a committee that formed to look at preservation techniques, and this is the tool that they have said that is the best one for that. Um, and you know, I want to support. I and I do. I personally support it. Um, and I, you know, I think that if we were to defer to look at it, unfortunately, and this is what breaks my heart because I really love my neighborhood. I spend a lot of time community building in my neighborhood. Is that those that are for it are largely homeowners? Not 100 percent. We're not looking at 100 percent. And those that are oppose it largely um, are investors, which I welcome in our neighborhood. That's not the point. It's just that those who live here seem to want it, and those who don't have more reservations about it. Um, thank you for your time. It's been a long day. I appreciate sure. it. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. We are closing public hearing. <laughs> Commissioners will discuss. Um, I do have sort of a general um, you know, you hear some comments about deferral, and we'd like to, you know, be sure that we've got our uh, procedures um, in line. So could you just enlighten us, please? Okay. Um, okay, several, several pieces of the puzzle um, at issue in, in this particular one. Um, I'll start with that one because that's what you've asked about in terms of um, deferrals. Um, you're governed by 174420 uh, on preservation permits, and it states that, uh, Section A states that consideration of applications, the Historic Zoning Commission shall meet within 15 working days after the receipt of an application. Oh, I'm sorry, this is for preservation permits only. Hold on just a second. I'm not sure that this would apply to um, to an overlay establishment. Hang on, let me confer with, with uh, council, um, with um, staff rather. Hold on just a second. And so I do have a question while they're conferring. And, and, and by the way, I want to thank everybody for hanging in because you've most of y'all have been here as long as we have. So thank you for being here and for your interest in the community, no matter which side of the issue that you're on. So for the staff, one of the questions I have is the Center for Historic Preservation at uh, MTSU uh, did uh, the um, architectural resource study. Does that qualify for what Mr. Harbison was asking as far as an architectural survey of the neighborhood? It does. Okay. And, and that's, I mean, and that's as credible an organization as we have in the state, so, uh, and, uh, okay. 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 Okay, I'm sorry, I'm ready on that question. Um, 
typically we are looking at preservation permits. So my mind went directly to your 30 day window that you have within um, which to grant or deny a preservation permit. Um, and if you don't do so within that time period, it's automatically approved. However, that is, as I read it, I began to realize it's only applicable to preservation permits. It is not applicable to um, historic zoning um, overlay recommendations. Um, the only thing that you know you all may want to take into consideration, or you or you may not, and you don't have to, is that you you have to provide a recommendation um, to the council. I don't know that you have any time period per se, if in terms of whether it will be approved or not, and the effect that you have similarly on preservation permits. If, however, you have not approved it, I don't. I believe that may affect the the council's ability to to take the matter up. So you may not necessarily be in a situation like you would be with a preservation permit where, you know, if you don't approve it within 30 days, it's automatically deemed approved, but you are in a situation that it is going to potentially affect um, the council um, and he may have to defer if you all defer. That, that would have been my question, is whether since the council person is the one who requested this, that would he have to be present or, you know, the council person be present to de defer? No, I don't think we, he would have to be present. So our board could could make that decision. Right, you could decide. Okay, clarity. We're good? Any questions on that? I would like um, Brad into the record, even though it, it already is part. So what, what our charge is as commissioners, um, in terms of considering this, application and then what that recommendation is. Um, uh, it's not necessarily based on my previous understanding of popularity contest, but, and I won't speak for, I'll, I'll let you sort of fill in the blanks. Okay, so you have several different pieces um, of the puzzle on, on these. Um, one, I'll start with your rules because your rules um, probably are more succinct in terms of what your um, your role is here, and then I'll go to some of the code provisions, if you like. Um, you have two sections. One talks about review criteria for designations, and it's really kind of more of the procedural pieces um, that have to, to be considered. But in my estimation, even more importantly are the review criteria. And it says in um, 7B, um, of your rules, review criteria, in reviewing applications or proposals for designating historic zoning and landmark or landmarks, the commission may take into uh, account the following. I'm sorry, the commission shall take into uh, uh, consideration the following. Number one, criteria for qualification and historic and or architectural significance as outlined in Metropolitan Code of Laws, section 1736-120. And I think you have probably all of that information already in your staff report, so I won't go to that section. Number two, the extent of agreement on design guidelines for the district or landmark between the commission and the neighborhood group property owners and others to be affected by the uh, by the designation. So those are your two criteria that by your rules you shall take into consideration. Um, do you want me to go further with the code sections? Can you say that one more time? Okay. So you have two pieces for your review criteria. In reviewing applications or proposals for designating historic zoning districts or landmarks, the commission shall take in, take the following into account. Number one, the criteria for qualification and historic and or architectural significance as outlined in Metropolitan Code of Law, section 1736-120. And number two, the extent of agreement on design guidelines for the district or landmark between the commission and the neighborhood group, property owners, and others to be affected by the designation. N now, um, I don't know if we need to go into kind of the code sections because I believe a lot of that has been dealt with by staff already, but if you like me to, I I'm happy to do that. I just don't want to, to belabor the issue if it's not necessary. Okay. 
I think that the other thing that's important to point out is that our action today is not final or binding. Uh, this uh, is a recommendation to the council. Uh, council will have public hearings on these. Uh, there is additional opportunity for conversation. Uh, I really liked um, one of the things that uh, Ms. Chapman said, that there needs to be more conversation. And, and I would encourage to the extent possible that when you have those conversations, that it not be so much pros meeting together and then going out and then cons meeting together and then going out as two separate groups, but groups getting together in people's homes and, neighbor and uh, neighborhood areas in small groups so that they can talk with the pros and the cons together and try to get the, the most uh, balanced information that you can uh, to seek that. It's, they're difficult things to do. Um, I do think that as we look at this, there's no question that uh, this neighborhood qualifies. Uh, based on the work that the staff has done, this, the Center for Historic Preservation. And, uh, and we all know the significance of this neighborhood. It means a lot to everybody that's been a part of this town. Um, I think that uh, today we've heard from about 35 of the 250 property owners, and uh, there have been a pretty balanced mix with uh, you know, a lot of people opposed, a lot of people supportive. I think that the, the councilman says that he feels he has the support. To me, it's really the onus of the councilman to ensure that he's got that, uh, the surveys and the supports uh, that he has to take it forward. He's ultimately the one that has to recommend it to the council and, uh, and stand before the council as the public hearings happen. So, um, so to me, I feel like, uh, for, for me, I feel comfortable with moving ahead with this proposal, uh, but that's just one commissioner. I think that was well said, Commissioner. Um, it still gives uh, the public uh, the ability to, to get together. So um, I think now you're educated, you're a bit educated, so go at it and, and be a good neighbor and um, reach out to your council person. Um, I think Councilman O'Connor is um, quite ready to hear you. He's, he said it. And so, um, you know, give that a platform for you all to, to move forward. Madam Chair, um, if I might be recognized for just one one piece, I just want to remind the board that right now we are um, we are at five members, and it takes five to have a quorum, but it takes four of the five to pass any motion. So whatever motion is made will have to have four affirmative votes. The chair normally only votes in a tie, but the chair would have to vote if there are not four uh, affirmative votes. So if there are four affirmative votes, then the chair doesn't have to vote. But if they're not, uh, oh, right. So, and, and, it, and it could necessitate multiple motions. So I just kind of want to prepare the board um, to be thinking about, as you think about what your motion is going to be, to be thinking about also uh, what is required under, under your rules. Thank you, Council. A question for the staff. Um, is the designated boundary, and this may be obvious, but I'm gonna ask it, is the designated boundary, um, there are properties listed within the boundary that are listed in the National Register of Historic Places or, and or would the, the, um, the listings in this current boundary be eligible for national no, there are none that are currently listed. Mm -hmm. I, I believe it would be a question for the State Historic Preservation Office, but I believe that it would qualify to be listed in the National Register. Okay. Just to keep conversation going for everyone's thoughts, um, I'm, I'm in full agreement with Commissioner Stewart um, on his thoughts on this and that, you know, it's um, eligible as a neighborhood, and it's you know uh, up to council and and to make final decision. But for us as a body, um, and the council members both in both districts um, have brought this to us, and so I'm just I'm I'm in agreement with uh, that. I also want to just acknowledge the neighborhood associations that have been like the coalition group um, and the neighborhood association, but. Uh, you know, you hear where they they started their work, you know, in 215 or 216, I think is what I heard. And, you know, to acknowledge that, um, 
is worthy because you have done some work. Um, there needs to be more work, but just to say that this is not the end and for somebody to say, uh, a comment to say, let's just scrap it, um, I think that's dishonor to the process. So this is a process and um, we're all human, um, so we do the best we can, um, but again, just reiterating that this is not the end goal right here. You've got other format, form, form to, to keep going on this process. So just wanted to acknowledge the work that has been done so far. With respect to the two charges on, under the designating, um, I want to state that under um, Article 3, Historic Overlay Districts 17.36.120, um, after hearing certainly the presentations here, but more importantly reviewing the um, designation for the conservation overlay, I find that, um, that it is compliant in, in item one, the historic landmarks associated with an event um, that's made significant contribution to local, state, or national history, and um, certainly homes within it also seem to uh, apply to item two, but in particular, item three, it embodies the distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction, um, or that represents work of a master or that possesses high artistic value as being, meeting those criteria. Certainly not all of the homes in there, that's not a statement of all of them, but in general, as we approve um, these designations or hear these designations, I find that to the presentation and the staff's um, report that it meets those. David, do you have comment? I uh, agree with uh, commis um, Commissioner Jones and Stewart and uh, the general discussion here that the neighborhood meets guidelines and it would be appropriate for us to move forward. With respect to the item before us, I, I move that uh, we accept the staff recommendation to uh, designate the Edge Hill Neighborhood Conservation Zoning Overlay. And then secondly, the design guidelines. We want to do that yes. at the same time. And Let's just do apply it. the uh, staff provided Edge Hill Neighborhood Conservation Design Guidelines. There's a motion. Is there a second? second? There's a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, there's no opposition, so I don't need to vote. There's four in okay. approval. Okay, thank you all for your patience as well. Have a good evening. I think we're not done. Next up, we have um, election of officers, which you do every two years. So this is your year to elect a new chair and a new vice chair. Do we do we have a quorum to do that? We you do? have quorum. Okay. Okay. Can can you guide us on that, um, Robin? Since we're we're all on an even plane here, so you have to. Um, so, so we're voting first for a, a chair, chair. A, a new okay. chair and a vice chair. All right. So, so we'll should need we a commissioner to make a recommendation? All right. So I bring it to the commission to uh, make a recommendation for the chair. Okay. So for the record, Manet Bell. Sorry, that. For the record, uh, Manet Bell. For chair. Yes. Okay. Thank please. You. <laughs> And um, I make recommendation for Cyril Stewart to be the vice chair. I, I, I would, okay, so, okay, somebody else say it. <laughs> you say it. <laughs> don't, don't put that one for the record. <laughs> Kaylin Jones recommends Cyril Stewart for vice chair. <laughs> Um, I think it, we've got two different uh, motions made by two different people without a second on either one oh, of them. Oh, sorry. Yeah, well, we, oh, oh, yeah, that's we fine. If you just want to recommend and then maybe someone would like to make a motion based on that recommendation. It was a recommendation. It was, yeah. Can, can we vote on both at the same time? Yes, if that's what your motion is. So, um, 
members still present, Madam Chair, for today. Um, we have a recommendation. Uh, can I hold for just one second? If I could ask everyone in the audience to take the conversations into the hallway. We're continuing our meeting, and I can't quite hear. Thank you. Um, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sure. So uh, we have uh, two recommendations on the floor, one from uh, Mr. Stewart yeah, that Manet Bell be um, nominated as the chair, and then we also have a, a recommendation for Cyril Stewart to be vice chair. So I formally move that we uh, adopt those recommendations. There is a motion. There is a second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. And there are four. So it's unanimous. So there you have your new board for two, I mean, your two uh, chairs for how many? What's the term? For two years. Two years. You maybe should have asked <laughs> that before you agreed. <laughs> <laughs> two years. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what's next on our agenda? Um, I, uh, we, she's not here, so. Okay. okay. Um, next is that our meeting will be at the Midtown Precinct um, on 12th Avenue next month in July. And I think there's one more month where we're really going to be moving around. Sorry for all of the confusion that causes. Um, but again, next month, July's meeting will be at the Midtown Precinct. Of course, that'll be on your agenda, and I'll send you a reminder as well. And I've also been reminded by staff, to uh, by, by Ms. Ziegler, to uh, respond to her RSVP to our meetings ASAP so that we know um, if we have quorum or not. Can uh, I, I guess also like to, uh, in the interest of something Ms. Jones say, may see in the future across her desk, uh, like it noted for the record that we had a member of staff to redirect any applicants who might have been, I mean, any uh, interested parties in today's deliberations who might have been directed to another location. Um, there was some signage and some additional effort made to direct all those folks in this direction to the location of the meeting. I will add to that that Chairman Tibbs also announced it at the Planning Commission meeting. An email was sent to everyone that we had received any emails on about those two projects. And um, the neighborhoods and the council members were encouraged to provide that information via the, the avenues that they had as well. So thank you. And I think we're adjourned. <laughs> This has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.gov.